Welcome to episode four of this mini tutorial series on how to play Rule the Waves 3 for complete beginners. We are starting out as France in 1890. We've taken time to sort out our fleet, uh, particularly with our quite heavy colonial requirements. We've started to build a fresh fleet with a new series of battleships and we have provoked a war with Italy, and we are about to start a battle. Convoy defense is one of my favorite styles of battle, along with, oddly enough, convoy attack. Um, the convoy part of it kind of grounds you to a particular part of the ocean, and you have to be aware of its position and your position relative to the enemy. Obviously, in defense, we need to be between the enemy and our convoy, and ideally lead the enemy away, get them obsessed with uh, fighting us and see how that goes. Now, we do have the ability to decline this and it would cost 306 victory points. I see no reason to do that at all. Um, I do occasionally decline tiny battles that are going to be quite, quite time consuming, but are not likely produce any great results. Um, destroyer actions are like this. They can be like two snakes wandering around all over the battlefield with very rarely do you get to um, a decisive position. But convoy defense, absolutely enough. Absolutely not. So let's accept this and zoom out into, oh, oh. I was going to say zoom out into the big screen and uh, and enjoy ourselves. And the Italians have declined. Let's zoom back in again. Um, but that is disappointing. That is disappointing. I'm not sure why, because our fleet seemed very evenly matched, but who knows how the, uh, the battle generator thinks at times. So let's click OK. OK, let's have a cruiser action. So this is unlikely to have the battleships involved. Um, the forces are our armored and protected cruisers. They seem to have fewer. Let's see if they will accept that one. And they have. So let's go to the big screen. And first of all, let's take a moment to orientate ourselves. So yes, we've got our three protected cruisers who seem to be screening our three armored cruisers, which is, you know, fair enough. Now, there's a lot going on around here, so I'm just going to turn the spotlight on and um, orientate ourselves a little bit. So, first of all, up here is our order of battle, and here are the ships that we have, as well as any coastal fortifications, which are usually of any less interest. This force at the top, we control. If there was another French force under AI control, it would be listed at the bottom. And sometimes it can be easy to miss, so do watch out for that. Next to the order of battle is the log, and this is where you will spend most of your time. It lists all the actions, all the gunnery, all the hits, all the sighting reports, all the sinkings, uh, all the torpedo hits, etc. during the course of the battle. For this turn and for the previous turn, there is a log up here, this book icon, that will list all of the ones that you've gone through and you can filter. So for example, you wanted to see all the torpedo hits, you can filter on torpedo. Next to the log are the reports. These are sighting reports. They're probably less important now, um, but if another friendly force were to spot uh, the enemy, then its position would be listed here. In the future, when aircraft become a thing, this becomes a much uh, more important uh, tab. And then you have objectives. So the objective here is to sink two ships of greater than 500 tons, and you get 8,000 victory points for it. So that's what this top stuff is. 
down here is the details for the course and speed of the current formation that you're on. So currently it's zero and all grayed out because we're not on any of these. Let's just click on the protected cruisers. And now we can see they're going 12 knots. Their course is 297. There are various controls here for speed. So you can set it at cruise speed. Oddly enough, that is 12 knots. You can tell it to go at 20 knots. You can tell it to go at 25 knots. Don't achieve anything because their maximum speed is only 22. You can tell it to go at that maximum speed minus two, which is surprisingly useful because if you run things at um, maximum speed, your stokers who are shoveling coal into furnaces will get tired quickly after about an hour or so. Whereas if you run at maximum minus two, they will be able to sustain a high speed for longer. Also, if you send the ship around at maximum speed, the ship can be liable to vibration. Less so in this era, where the maximum speeds are 21, 22 knots, but later on when the speeds are approaching or exceeding 30 knots, vibration could become an issue, and that can make it really difficult to do fire control because the whole thing is chuddering away. So maximum speed minus two is a nice sustained speed to do. And then finally, there's uh, squad max. And the squad max speed um, is what it implies, the as fast as the slowest ship in your squadron or division will be able to sail. Sometimes when ships are going too slowly, you may have to um, detach them. So those are those controls down there. The little turn together checkbox is a device to allow your ships to turn simultaneously in line abreast rather than line ahead. It's usually used as a torpedo avoiding maneuver. And these two final ones, you've got this red arrow. This is a way of setting the course. So I could click up here. Uh, I could control click up here and then click again, and it will set a course for you. It, it's not a feature I tend to use. And then this target icon is to allow you to manually set a target. Again, I tend not to use it. The AI is pretty good at making you shoot at the nearest, biggest, best target that you have. It's only occasionally that you'd want to interfere with that, particularly if you feel that the target is sinking. Oh, it's stopped, it's dead in the water, it's being pounded. There's not much point carrying on shooting at it. You're just wasting ammunition and there's a better target to shoot at. So those are those controls at the bottom. You also have this little inset here that shows you the ship that you currently have selected. So uh, the fax is shown here. If I click on the Admiral Sharma, uh, it will show that instead. I can right click on the icon there and it will show me the ship details tells you how much ammunition you have available of different sorts. So we have 104 armor piercing and 26 high explosive shells for our eight inch guns. There is an advanced thing under doctrine where you can change this if you wish. Uh, I don't recommend that you do that just now. There's a reminder here of what your likely penetration is. So once you've identified what class of warship you have, you'll be able to check to see whether you can penetrate its belt armor uh, at various ranges. There is a rate of fire. Um, this is currently not working because we haven't started firing. And there is crucially this hit chance. So. Almost certainly the most interesting thing uh, about gunnery is the hit chance. And you can see that when you look at the whole division and it will tell you here who the target is and in brackets, it will give you the hit chance. If your hit chance is less than 1%, 
you're not doing very well. If your hit chance is three, three and a half, that's reasonable. And if it's five or more, that's very, very good. You can bring up that same dialog box by right clicking on the little icon here. But when you're zoomed out as I am, that takes quite a bit of skill. You can, I'm using the mouse wheel, uh, zoom in. And we can bring this up again. Here is the secondary guns and similar data about its ability to penetrate armor. So 2.2 inches at 5,000. Uh, and again, details of its rate of fire. Uh, this is done on two sides because it literally has two broadsides, one port, one starboard. And then finally, some information about your tertiaries. Not normally need to look at that. Here is your uh, torpedo tubes, which are submerged. So you have one launcher and you have two reloads. Your crew quality. Now, slightly oddly, the crew quality is given as a number, whereas on the main screens, it's given as a word. So I believe the Amaral Sharma's crew quality is good. Uh, hence zero. If it was fair, it would be minus one. If it was poor, it would be minus two. The fire control, which is only local, i.e. rubbish. Then two really important pieces here is the damage. So your structure damage, your superstructure damage, really, your above the waterline damage, and your flotation damage, uh, your below the waterline damage. If Flotation reaches 100%, you sink. If your superstructure damage reaches 100%, you are likely wrecked. Um, and it's pretty likely that um, fires will break out and it's quite possible that uh, they will abandon ship. For flotation damage, you'll get a flooding figure. And the flooding is really important important because you want it to be zero. If it's a hundred and something, you're in a bad way and you need to slow down to at least 10 knots and possibly even stop so that you give your crew the maximum amount of opportunity to do damage control, to shore up bulkheads and to contain the flooding. If you get the flooding down to single figures, that's good, but be aware that that can still mean that the flooding will slowly fill up and you may sink due to progressive flooding, i.e. they never really get it fully under control. Down here, it tells you how many heavy hits, how many medium hits. Uh, heavy means 11 inch or more. Medium means 10 to six and light means five to two uh, inch guns. Torpedo hits and for later on bomb and missile hits. There's also a log here which will describe everything that's happened to the ship in this battle, which can be helpful to uh, look up, particularly when you're doing a little bit of uh, post battle analysis. Obviously nothing's happened here. Uh, your maximum speed, so our maximum speed is 22 knots, and our actual maximum is 22 knots, so that's great. If you start to take damage, that first number can go down as the damage increases. The current speed is 12, um, and you don't normally have to worry about the endurance. So I'm just going to close that down, and we're going to zoom out. And we're going to have a little look at these controls across the top. So, first of all, who we are, just in case you need reminding, we are the French. Uh, save. So, if you need to save the battle and then exit because life, that's how you do that. Um, end game. And um, technically, that probably should say end battle. So, uh, if I go down to here, um, you get a variety of pieces of information. So you get the time, the geographic position, the, um, the day, or the date, the uh, 
the time uh, time elapsed. So this battle is expected to take 500 minutes and we've had one minute elapsed. You can click on end game if this has gone over half the time, so over 250 in this case, and there are no active ships engaged or near to each other. It's a way of saying, oh, look, we've, we've all gone our separate ways. Nothing's happening. Let's end the battle now. The game will do that automatically. And it will do that automatically if the time runs out. If you get to 500 minutes and the battle is still actively being played out, then uh, extra time will be added. The game won't just go, well, you've had your time now. The local time, so this time is... Uh, Greenwich Mean Time. So the local time here is an hour in advance because we're in Central European time. And then an estimate of the range. As I move this, you can see the range changes from the ship I have currently selected. So from the Amaral Sharma. Let me take this off for a moment and we'll zoom out a little bit till we can see where we saw the sh target, where is the unknown ship? It seems to have disappeared. It will reappear in a moment. So we can measure, for example, the distance from the Amaral Sharma to the Suffax by just moving there. And I can see down below, I can read that off as 3,057 yards or 1.51 nautical miles. So handy little distance calculator so that you can tell what the range is. Back up here is next preferences. So there are all sorts of warning messages and flotation messages and pausing on battles and stuff like that. Um, this is actually preferences for the whole game, not just for the battle, just so you're aware. You can leave these in default. You can change them or mess around with them at your liberty. I talked in an earlier episode about Admiral's Mode, Rear Admiral's Mode, and Captain's Mode. That you cannot change whilst you're in a battle, but you could change that uh, afterwards. There's also some volume controls for the background noise, which I tend to have set low. And your ability to give the decks of various ships a color so that you can easily tell them apart or more easily tell them apart. Um, I'm not going to prescribe anything around this. You can mess around yourself as you wish. Next up is zoom in and zoom out. I just tend to use the mouse wheel and use the right mouse button to move around. So let's just go in. This one, view all ships, which is technically quite useful, but actually I don't tend to use it very much. But if you click on it, you then zoom into the point where you can see your whole fleet. And if you've got quite a dispersed and large fleet, that actually can be pretty handy. Next is this show missile control panel. I don't think we need to worry about that in 1892. This next one is surprisingly useful. Lock view to division. So what normally happens is the ships will sail along currently at 12 knots and they're all pointing this way. So they will all go in that direction and eventually they will disappear off the edge of the map and you have to kind of right click and go and see them further on. That's fine in, in many battle situations, but if you have a chasing engagement, you're chasing them or they're chasing you, it can actually be a bit tedious having to scroll all the times as uh, you rush across the ocean. So clicking this lock view to division will mean that we will now be centered on this division and air all the movement this will stay still and all the movement will be relatively relative to it around and if we click on this division instead then it will be located to this one instead let's take that off because i don't think we're going to have that kind of battle 
probably. Then we have various views. So we have the sighting range. So let me just zoom out a little bit. Uh, let me take all of these off. So that is the sighting range of the ships in the protected cruiser, the light cruiser division. And if I click on the Admiral Sharma, that's the sighting range from the armored cruiser. Usually I have this turned on. This is the gun range. So as you can see, that's quite a lot smaller than the sighting range and smaller still for the uh, protected cruisers, although not that much smaller. This is the torpedo range, so very much smaller. And if I go to the Admiral Sharma, you can see it's quite tiny. So you need to get in quite close. If I go to and measure it, it is set to about 1,800 yards. Then in green, we have your radar range. Don't have to worry about that. Next, we have air ranges. Again, we don't have to worry about that. And then finally, missile ranges. This red line shows who you're firing at um, for your selected division. So it would show a red line out to the enemy ships that it is engaging. It's red for your main armament. It is other colors, I forget now, for your secondary armament. This uh, ship icon show enlarged inset view is this one down here. So it turns it on and turns it off. I always have it turned on. This next one is the various names. So you can see at the moment, I have objectives ticked. So sometimes you can have a point in the ocean to say, go there and sink some ships. We haven't got one of them. So not needing to worry about that. There are base flags. So as you can see, these appear and disappear around the various areas. I usually have that on reports so as i said earlier if you have another force and that sights the enemy a blue flag will pop up or later on when we have aircraft if they have sighting reports blue flags will pop up for that let's zoom in a little bit we have ship names which do what they say again i always have that turned on and then finally you have division names so the first light cruiser division and the first cruiser division i personally tend to have that turned off. For ship names, you have the option to either have the names of capital ships or the, just the type of ship or the type of ship excluding destroyers or nothing. So if I have nothing, let me just get rid of that one, then they will go off. If they have the type excluding destroyers, then it just says CLCA. The type alone does the same, but also would say DDs for all the destroyers. For the capital ships, it has the same because we have no battleships or aircraft carriers here. Uh, they would be named and everything else would be CL and CA. And then all. I tend to have it on all because I like to see who's involved and who's being heroic and who's been an idiot following some weird course that I never expected. Occasionally, if the battle is really big, I might just set it to capital ships uh, and focus primarily on them. Next up in these video control style buttons, we have various speeds. So this first one is progress the action one minute. This next one is run for five minutes. This next one is run for a number of hours. This next one is just run, just continuously. Uh, and this one, obviously, pause. I tend not to use any of these because I use the keyboard. So I use the space bar or the number one for a minute. 
And then you can use the keyboard numbers for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine minutes if you wish, cunningly using one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And zero will be the same as just run. And I tend to use one minute when I'm in action, in the thick of action. I tend to use five minutes if I'm approaching action, but we're not quite there yet, or if we're hunting for something. And I tend to use run for when we are disengaged. Up to you, whatever suits you. Next up is this game speed. So you can set it to very slow to ultra fast. I don't know why you would have it at slow or slower or very slow. I, I never use them myself. I tend to have it set for normal or for ultra fast. If you are engaged in combat, the ultra fast will get put back to faster just because so much is happening. If you are disengaged, the ultra fast will go to ultra fast game. So this red button will shine if you're in combat and the game speed will slow down because of that. If it's off as it is here, then you can run at ultra fast. Um, these spinning controls just is another way of selecting that. I'm not sure why that's necessary. This red button game speed to fastest available is what I normally have it set to. And I let the game control that. Um, it may say like, well, Dickie, why would you go ultra fast when you're trying to do intricate maneuvers? But if you're only advancing one minute at a time, then actually it, it really has uh, makes no impact. This icon shows you the weather. So here you have the sea and the sky and a little bit of low cloud. The weather it will show rain and all that kind of stuff. There is also this report down here, which is for me a little bit low visibility. I wish they'd give it a bit more prominence. So it actually says the weather is drizzle. If my memory serves me right out of the 50 odd different modifiers to gunnery, I think that might give you a minus one on your gunnery. The wind is calm and from the south southwest. And there's an arrow up here showing you that. Uh, and again, I, I wish these two were together. That will impact smoke. So because it's calm, the smoke will be slow to clear. And if the smoke is interfering with other ships firing, then that could be quite a bit of a nuisance. So if we look here, the, once they get going, the smoke will interfere with the ships behind if they're trying to fire in the direction in which they're traveling. I'll come to that in a sec. The range, the daylight sighting range is only 13,500. Now, normally on a non-drizzly day, you would expect something like 25,000 or something. The nighttime range is 3,000, which is quite common. How do we know what the time is? Well, we know that the time is down here. We know the local time is 10.54, so just coming up to 11 o'clock. We also have this clock icon, which will tell you how long you've got to sunrise or sunset, and is fantastically useful and is usually one of the first things I do. I usually come in, I press the red arrow, and I press this, and it will tell me... Um, the Zulu time, Greenwich Mean Time, and the local time. It says it's daylight. Dusk will be at 5.49 Zulu. So it's actually referencing everything from Greenwich Mean Time. Doesn't really matter. What does matter is that that's going to be in 7 hours and 50 minutes, or in 470 minutes. And remember, this scenario is set to be 500 minutes long. So if the scenario plays out as expected, it will almost all be in daylight and then dusk 
will settle just at the end. If the fighting carries on, it will go into dusk, which lasts for 30 minutes, and then into nighttime. So a really important thing to keep in mind, because this really tells you how much time you've got to play with to fight this battle to a decisive moment. You know, if it's, if it's an hour before dusk, the chances are you're not going to be able to achieve very much. Whereas here, seven, nearly eight hours of daylight, that's a good chunk of time in order to, uh, to do something. The book here, as we've noted, is the log entry, should you need to do that. The little ship icons here is the almanac under a different name. Uh, really, in case you need to go and understand what Italian ships you might be facing. So I would expect to see some Nino Bixo uh, from the Italians and probably some Marco Polos. And I can go and have a little look at what our intelligence is around that. Once the ships actually pop into view, then you can right click on them and uh, bring up an assessment of what they are uh, more directly. These controls are for aircraft, so we need not bother with that. This brings up a little list of some of the shortcuts that I've um, been talking about. Uh, this adds a note to the map. And that's what this little green flag is and here. So I'm going to add one. I'm going to put it here. Oh, let's put it there. And we will call it start position. And actually that shot forward an entire minute. So something to bear in mind. So there is that start position. So you can see how the smoke is shown and the smoke is actually in the way of the ships as they sail in this direction. You'll notice that it says paused here and that will carry on. So as I advance it one minute at a time, it will go into pausing. Ah, here's the unidentified ship that uh, we were concerned about. So from the Emerald Sharma, that is now just short of 13,000 yards away, and from the Suffax, a little bit under 11,000 yards away. When a flag is yellow, it's the focus of your interest. When it's red, it's not. When it's a triangle, it's under the AI control. And when it's a square, so AI controlled, no. And it becomes a square. When you're in Rear Admiral mode, you can have a look at other squadrons and divisions in your fleet, and you can take them off AI control. If you keep them on AI control, then you can't change the formation, but you can change the role. So currently these protected cruisers are set to screen. And I have a range of tactical options that I could use to give them a general uh, direction of how to behave. Now, if I set it to manual, it doesn't matter too much, but it's worth understanding what these do. So independent says what it does, what it says, it can go off and do its own thing completely. If it goes out of line of sight from your flagship, it will go back into AI control and try and get back in touch with your flagship. If I set it to core, it would go into line a line ahead and follow on behind your um, your main division, uh, my uh, armored cruisers in this case. If I set it to support, it would go to the disengaged side and slightly to the rear and wait to be useful. Um, that's a really good one for destroyers for when you're waiting for an opportunity to launch a good torpedo flotilla attack, uh, but want them out the way for, for now so that they're out of harm's way. Scouting sends them far in uh, advance uh, in order to find the enemy. 
we've found the enemy, so no need for that. Screen places them just ahead uh, in order to um, protect them, particularly at things like nighttime or later on when there are torpedo, uh, there are submarines as a submarine screen. And then patrol keeps them in a fixed area around. Um, that's useful for aircraft carriers in the future, but you don't have to worry about that. So the question here is, do I keep them as core and just make them form part of the battle line? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, I might set them to independent so that they can go off. Often with an enemy, I like to try and sandwich it between two separate forces. So it's receiving gunfire from both sides or to have them as support, uh, keeping out of harm's way. Well, these are quite capable ships, certainly against the Italians. So I'm going to say you need to be core. As core, I want you to be in line ahead. And I'm going to let the AI control that. But if the AI goes a bit bonkers, as it easily can do at this early stage in fleet command and control, then I'll take over control myself. This means all I have to do is control the armored cruisers and the protected cruisers should form up behind in a nice line. And that's all you need to know to fight a battle. So I'm going to pause now because this has turned into quite a long episode to take you through all of this. And in the next episode, we will fight the battle. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.